morning one more time. I hope it's getting well so far. So thank you again for the introduction, Paul. Um, I would like to welcome you once again to the Africa Bitcoin Conference. And I want to thank you, Ray, for joining us. There is a very beautiful story between Paxful and the genesis of this conference. Even before the African Bitcoin, Friends Conf uh, Bitcoin Conference was launched, um, some of us, a group of young Togolese activists, were interested in knowing more about Bitcoin. And Paxful here was generous enough to fly those activists all the way from Togo to Abuja to get a training on how to use Bitcoin in their civil resistance work. And we feel so very grateful to have wherever I go, how do I buy Bitcoin? I, I, I just have mobile money or cash, how do I do? I say, check out Paxful, because Paxful offers dozens of solutions of how you can actually access the resources. And Ray has a beautiful story about that, because he's originally from Egypt, and this is gonna lead me to my first question. What inspired you from your personal experience into creating a platform like Paxful. Well, thank you, Frida. I appreciate the intro. I appreciate the props and the plugs. You're awesome, sister. You put together an amazing conference with some amazing people. And the ultimate thing that inspired me is people themselves. You know, this company that I built, Paxful, all right, it's a nice company, but all it is is just a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace built on top of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. It's called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is cool. It's awesome. But it's just a piece of technology. Let's never forget the important thing here. The focus is on the people, the peers that are using this technology to solve real problems every single day. So it's all about the people. Everything that I've learned, I've learned from the people. And it was the people that inspired me. If you fast, you know, go back eight years, I had a Bitcoin startup which didn't really work didn't solve a problem that existed. And the problem was there wasn't enough Bitcoin in the hands of people, and there wasn't enough Bitcoin in the hands of people that needed it most. It was still just a speculative game, and that narrative is still strong now. It was a store of value, but that's it. But I believed in the power of Bitcoin to help real people daily where they need it most. To that effect, I had to create something to get Bitcoin to the places that need it most, like right here in Africa, right? But that's a huge challenge. So let's think about it from a product guy, an entrepreneur, right? You're trying to figure out, okay, I believe Bitcoin can help Africa. And eight years ago, I was saying, Bitcoin you know, is going to be championed by the peoples of Africa, and Africa will lead adoption because they need it. And all I got was people laughing in my face, right? They're like, oh, the Africans, they'll never figure it out. They're only making $2 a day. What need do they have for Bitcoin? Fast forward eight years later right now, Africa leads the world in Bitcoin adoption. So we've won, guys. This is our victory lap. We have been proven right. And the beautiful thing is it's just starting. We have only just begun. These next seven years, we will witness something unprecedented. Let me make it clear that the youth of Africa, particularly Western Africa, I have to give my love to our fourth biggest market here, Ghana, and our number one market, Nigeria. Props to all the Nigerians here in Ghana. I know you brothers and sisters like to get around. <laughs> and what you guys have done is absolutely amazing. You have shown us the killer app of Bitcoin. While everyone else in the world was just using it as you know, funny money to make more money and play games, you guys are using it every single day. You turned it into a Hawala 2.0. And the first time I came here to Western Africa was about eight years ago. And it was only when I actually met the people here, I sat down with them, we smoked hookah, we talked, and they told me about their problems every single day, their problems sending money abroad, receiving money. And I was like, my goodness, how are these people not extinct? They are literally, their money is trapped in a prison. And then it became clear to me, finally, what the biggest problem in the world was. And the biggest problem in the world is economic apartheid. That is why the global south is poor. In the 1980s, one naira was worth more than a dollar. 
and now it's 1,000 to 1. What happened? Did these people just stop working? No, something's going on beyond our measure, but we have an equalizer. I would like to give Bitcoin a lot of thanks, but it's all about the people. The people here, they inspired me. The fact that they've been fighting through this system for the past, what, 100 years? And now when they finally understand that they have a tool to use it, I could only support them in every way possible, no matter what comes. With education, building a platform, supporting the youthful voters in Nigeria right now. And by the way, this election happening in Nigeria right now is the most important in the world. I want everyone to be aware of what's happening every day and to do everything in our power to support those people. Because again, it is all about the people. And it is the youth of Africa that have inspired me to build what I built. And honestly, they built it for me. <laughs> they showed me what the hell I should be doing. So thank you. Thank you, Ray. That, that's, a compelling, that's a compelling story. Um, when you mention the skepticism that comes when people hear about Africa and Bitcoin on the, on, on, on the assumption that Africans do not have money, so what will be the point of them investing in Bitcoin? What's, there's a lot of meat around money in Africa, but um, the reality is that this is a continent that generates billions of dollars, trillions of dollars in trade alone. And unfortunately, interstate trade has been completely uh, harmed by the multiple currencies we have on this continent. We have a continent of 54 nations and more than 40 currencies, which is insane. Uh, you are a trader in Togo. Before you buy products in, in, in Ghana, you have to convert it in cities and then reconvert the price to Ghana, uh, to, to CFA before pricing it. And with the depreciation that comes continuously, it's a headache for our businesses. Now, the question that I have for you is, how can companies like Paxful can help solidify interstate trade on the continent by breaking those walls, those colonial uh, monetary walls and colonial political walls that are preventing people from easily uh, uh, doing business from one country to another? Great point, sister. So I want to bring something up that you said. The complexity of doing business in Africa is immense. You literally need an economics PhD just to be able to do business here. That's how much complexity there is in moving money around this continent. It is literally easier to fill up a suitcase full of cash, put it on a plane and a bus, mm -hmm. and do business. There are 2,000 payment networks in Africa, and only 2% of them talk to each other. Think about that kind of segregation. It's segregation of money. That's why I call this thing, this matrix that we're living under economic apartheid. It is the biggest problem in the world, and yet Africans find a way to make it happen. So let's consider for a moment a different thing. Let's say a vision of the world where these 54 states of Africa were united by one currency. Wow. Can you imagine what the result would be? To put it into a relation, imagine if there were 51 currencies in America and you couldn't send money from New York to New Jersey without going through a month's worth of headache. How developed would the United States be? Would it be the mightiest country in the world? No, nowhere near. And that should give us some understanding of the potential of Africa if there was a unified money system. Now, we can't expect the French to give up their 14 colonies over here overnight. They're certainly not going to do it, right? Colonizers aren't backing off, right, on their uh, shadow colonization schema. It's a little too profitable for them. We can't expect the rest of the African states to get this all together in time. But let me make it clear, in Western Africa, there was the eco here, right? This was a currency for Western Africa. There have been many pan-African currencies attempted. And what was the result? Yeah. They disappeared. The last guy that tried to do this ended up getting his convoy blown up by a cruise missile. And that wasn't enough. They had to sodomize him on camera. And Hillary Clinton laughed about it. That is the kind of pressure the people in Africa are under. Anyone that raises up their head to combat this menace, to fight this thing, like Bernard said, gets their head chopped off, or they are thrown under the jail. How do you win against such an opponent that can target any one of us?
Simple. An army of mosquitoes, peer to peer. We have had the solution in front of us all the time. So how can we help all these peers, all these young people that are figuring out ways to make the money flow? This is the key, guys. Stacking sats is nice. Everyone should stack sats. But the only thing that's better than stacking sats is making those sats flow. Because free trade creates wealth. This is the beauty of being human. It is not a zero-sum game. When humans trade freely between each other, wealth is generated. That means we get something far greater than the sum of its parts. This is what God said to the angels when he created humans, and they questioned if we were going to mess up like the creations that came before us, right? He said, I know something that you don't. And I feel we all know what that is. To be human is to be, have this great power of creativity and generativity, and money is a solution. If you make the money flow, wealth will be created. This is our birthright. This is what we're good at. This is why we are destined to win. And we have all the tools in front of us right now. So what has my little company been doing? All right, there's been about, over, I think, five to six billion dollars in trade since inception here in Africa. And the beautiful thing is, there's no front running. There's no back running, there's no margin trading, there's no leverage, there's none of this hanky-panky or dodginess happening. This is real trade between people, $5 billion. It's a great start, but we can do a lot more. Now, we've invested in education heavily, it's very important. Why? Because we don't want people's first exposure to Bitcoin being, oh man, did you hear about this latest crypto? Let's get in, these are all Ponzi's. And that's when interest in Bitcoin rises up People buy in, the founder disappears, and they all get scammed, and every week it repeats. I am sick and tired of being left here to pick up the pieces. We need to go on the offensive, and that is what education is about. We are thinking 20 years ahead, but 20 years is too long to wait. We've got seven years to make this happen. Seven years to help everyone here trade Bitcoin freely and to free themselves. I would like to talk more about this, but honestly, I could probably give an hour-long sermon on this. So maybe I'll let you get to your next question, Frida. <laughs> well, it, it, it's always beautiful listening to how passionate you are on this topic. And, and by the way, I want to take this opportunity to announce that Paxful has partnered with the Africa Bitcoin Conference to create a training center here in Ghana. Uh, the training center has been real. <laughs> The training center has been built in Kumasi, Ghana, and on December 8th, which is Thursday, uh, we are offering opportunities for those who are interested in signing up to go on a day trip to Kumasi to visit the training center for people to go there and learn more about Bitcoin because we want the information to be accessible to everyone, for citizens to be able to make choices that are informed, to also prevent people taking advantage of them based on their ignorance. So once again, thank you, Paxful, for supporting us in this process. And we hope to see the next conference happen with millions of more Africans more knowledgeable about what Bitcoin is. And this leads to my next question. One of the biggest challenges on this continent has been regulations towards Bitcoin, regulation towards any economic innovation or monetary innovation. Uh, and it is, a, it is rather a, a very offensive regulation. There are countries that have banned Bitcoin. And unfortunately, Bitcoin is still not legal in Ghana, just like it is the case in most of our countries. How do, we, how do you think that a citizen can eventually push our government to do the right thing, to understand that we are at a point where they need to get on the bandwagon and they need to start pushing for changes that are going to enable us to completely break away from the monetary systems that have maintained us in poverty for decades? I think you just gave us the answer, sister. We've been on the defensive for far too long. It's time yeah. for us to go on to the offense. Mm -hmm. you know? There's a lot of builders in this room, right? Bernard, Absolutely. master builder. I'm looking at master builders here. We don't like to involve ourselves in politics. We like to focus on what we're good at, right? Sure. But the problem is if you're not at the table, you're on the table, right? Absolutely. It's about time we accepted this. And we should also rejoice in the fact that we have some power right now. Mm. We have some voice. 
and influence. We can start working together to affect change. We can start opening up dialogues with these regulators. We can start lobbying. These are things that we have to do. We can't run away from this. Egypt, where I was born, crypto and Bitcoin is illegal there. Mm -hmm. We met with the central bank there and they agreed to let us start educating people about it. I'll take that. It's a start. But we can do a lot more. So you guys notice I'm wearing a uh, Bitcoin Citadel pin right here. Bitcoin Citadels are cool. It's very tempting for us to kind of build a castle where we can call home and sit there and we've got our walls and defenses up. But that's defensive. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I need, I need a lot more space. I say we make Africa, the entire continent, our Bitcoin Citadel. That is the path forward. But to do that, we must be on the offensive. We must think offensively and we must start thinking bigger. For the past seven years or more, actually it's almost been what? 14 years here in Bitcoin, right? Yeah. What's been our mission? Our mission has been to replace banks with wallets. I don't know about that. That's not too exciting to come to a normal person and tell them, hey, get rid of your bank and put your life savings on your computer. It's kind of scary. And it's not thinking big enough. We need to be thinking far bigger and we need to be thinking offensively. What does that mean? That means we stop looking at the banks and stop trying to compete with them. They are gone, they are done, they are dinosaurs, they are done and dusted, forget about them, let sleeping dogs lie. I wouldn't buy a bank if you paid me. I don't want the trouble. That is the old world. Let's start looking at who's been doing the job right. The telcos. The telcos here in Africa have been pioneering mobile money for the past 30 years. They have shown the world. This is before PayPal or anything else. Africa has already been leading. And how did they do it? They extended real utility to people, communications. And from there, payments is just another form of communication. We have to look at that model, copy that, start working with them, because that is the path to reach the man and the woman on the street. This is the key. Our goal should be one billion citizens across not just Africa, but the entire Global South. Because all of us here in the Global South, we are all equal. We have all been treated the same way. This system has not been built for us. That is a lie. And in fact, the more we wake up, the more of that red pill that we nibble on, we start to realize that this system is working against us and has been designed to do so from the very beginning. We are in a state of war and we are only now just realizing it. That means we cannot work with this old system. But we must be smart. We are not antagonistic. We are not against anything. We are for peace. I named my company Paxful. Pax means peace in Latin for a reason. Bitcoin brings free trade. And the promise of that, the ability, the potential to put all these young people to work, that will create wealth. And if we're all wealthy, what do we have to fight about? We need to start sharing that wealth and thinking strategically and bringing in these government operators. They are not all bad people. They're people like us. They're just starting to learn, and they're a bit confused, they're a bit scared. It's up to us to not be afraid to show our faces and to show we're doing the right thing. Let's put things in relation right now. This FTX collapse has torn the veil off this hideous creature that is crypto. It is a system built on speculation. It is toxic from the very beginning. Yet, because... Because of all the money that was flowing around and the easy gains, everyone that got into crypto was thinking they're going to be the next Gordon Gecko. And now we're all seeing how hideous that specter really is. And now we're all starting to listen to the people that have been speaking the truth from the very beginning. And I'm very proud and honored to say that so many of them are in this room right now. Thank you all so much for being strong. No one in here launched their own token. No one in here ever will, inshallah. <laughs> Everyone here is awesome. Be proud of that. Ray, I wish we had more time to So do I. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good warm-up. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to leave the stage for the next panel. Uh, one of the key things that I took from your message is the call for us to be more political, for a young, young generation to understand that they have to be at the realm of decision-making.
Um, and as an activist myself, I am proud to say that we had some amazing sponsors like Human Rights Foundation that managed to help us bring dozens of activists from all over the continent to be at this conference today so that the people that are fighting for freedom and social justice take part in a movement that is aimed at dismantling economic appetite and economic abuse. And we are proud of having you all today. And I wish you once again the best. Thank you so much, Ray, for joining me. And please enjoy the rest of your day.